Bob, I'm always fascinated to hear physicists talking about the beauty of the universe, the beauty of their equations. Uh, how do you define beauty when you look at the universe? Well, I define it like pornography. I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. <laughs> what are some examples? What, what do you see that you find beautiful? Well, I'll tell you. The thing I find most most beautiful is um, the existence of law. The fact that some things, some some things that you measure are related to each other. I don't see any reason why that had to have been true. And it's uh, very lucky it is true because it helps you navigate around in the world. Uh, yes, I find that um, very beautiful. Now, look, beauty is, uh, of course, a very personal thing. I also find granite rocks beautiful and, and big redwood trees beautiful and, and women beautiful. And, and so perhaps we'd best not go there. <laughs> Well, I mean, your, your comment is an interesting one because the assumption is is that when you have a physical law, it is sort of had to be that way, and then you, you can't think. But you say it didn't have to be that way. I mean, there's there's nothing logical that would require physical law to be that way, but it is, and it it's nice. Uh, in our Western culture tradition. We think of regularity and law as being natural, mm. something that ought to be so. But in fact, it isn't the case at all. When Galileo first figured out that motion was regular, the Pope put him in jail. It was a very, very dangerous idea because it meant that there were inanimate reasons why things in the world behave the way they did. Now, uh, Modern times, we we think of it uh, 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 mechanically, but I guess f those of us who deal with nature a lot don't think of these things as mechanically. We think of them as living, breathing nature, and uh, like many other things in nature, they are very beautiful. <laughs> when you look at uh, solid state physics, which is your area of expertise, uh, it's the combining of lots of little things to make uh, a bigger thing, and sometimes the things are very large, little crystal lattice structures and all of that. Uh, do, do those things exhibit a, a, a kind of collective beauty when you have individual things that kind of come together and suddenly you have something that you didn't expect? Sure, but let me tell you a little secret. The reason that I got interested in solid-state physics wasn't practicality. It was simply that the experiments that people were doing were so much better mm. uh, and so much more numerous that I felt I could really gain a, a deep understanding of things from, from top to bottom. Now, it turned out, as a wonderful side effect, that a solid is a beautiful allegory of the vacuum of space, which, of course, is the thing that really interests all real physicists. What I found as I got into it was uh, it's, 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 there are many things, it, all the way from magnetism to structural instabilities to liquid crystals to spins. Now, let me give you a nice concrete example. Transistors work with extra phosphorus atoms that are stuck in. Mm -hmm. Well, when you cool a piece of silicon down, the extra electron of the phosphorus begins to whirl around quantum mechanically, the phosphorus site, in apt analogy to the whirling around of an electron around a proton. In fact, you get exactly the same quantum mechanics, and you can measure it optically, except that the energy level splittings are 100 times smaller mm. than they would be in an atom. Why? Well, because the silicon is a dielectric it makes all the electric forces smaller. But nonetheless, the atomic energy levels are beautifully sharp and you can make spectroscopy on them. Now why this is relevant, of course, is that the vacuum of space also has a dielectric constant. And the atomic energy levels that we see are similarly less than they would have been had the stuff of the universe not been there. We know this because of high energy impact experiments. Hmm. Also, subtle things like the so-called lamb shift. 
so that's one example, but there are many, many more. Well, what's fascinating is that these two things seem as opposite as you can get. A real piece of stuff in the macroscopic world that you could put on a desk or put on your lap, some solid that has a structure, and the absolute vacuum where there's nothing that we know in it, but, but from quantum physics we know that it's kind of a cauldron of virtual things going in and out of existence and energy levels and... No, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're over-complexifying <laughs> things now. In either case, when you measure them in a subtle, low-energy experiment, they seem empty. And the same thing is true with a piece of silicon. An extra electron just whizzes through there as though the atoms didn't exist. Mm -hmm. Now, in that case, we know it's a collective principle that causes it to happen. In the vacuum, we don't. But in either case, the bottom line is the same. So in a piece of silicon, all the complexity vanishes away in the experiment you care about, and all you have is this extra particle moving around according to laws that are extremely simple. Now that simplification that happens in there is why the electronics industry is possible. That simplification is extremely powerful, and it makes all the mistakes that you make in engineering not matter. So I think probably they are related. And, and does this mean there's some kind of fundamental general theories that, that, that operate in, in such diverse domains? That yes, they're definitely, and we know what they are. We have names for them. We, there's a fancy name called, called um, I can't even remember my own names now, uh, uh, universality. Phases of matter have low energy quantum properties, which are universal. They don't depend on details. That's certainly what's going on in the silicon. And I think the experiments are telling you it's what's happening in the vacuum also.